Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. Father, thank you for um, the privilege of being together today. We do thank you for the work that you're doing in our church and in our city, and we pray that you would pour out your spirit. We pray that you would shape our hearts. You would, we pray that you would give us a hunger and a passion for your word to come to it and allow it to shape us and to trust that you have spoken finally through the Son, through Christ. Father, protect us from walking away and wavering from that trust in you and what you've given us in your word as it points us to Jesus. And so we lift this time up to you. We lift our hearts up to you and ask that you would move and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, happy Father's Day. Um, this is, yeah, it's always interesting. Throughout our country, um, I was looking at some statistics just this morning that Mother's Day is one of the top attended Sundays for churches in the entire year. In fact, in the calendar, it is the third highest church attendance of the year after Easter and Christmas, which are actually part of the church calendar. Father's Day ends up lower than other. <laughs> And so it is the least attended Sunday across the United States each year. Um, and and I don't, you, we could you know, speculate all kinds of reasons why that is. Um, mothers and grandmothers have dragged their families to church for generations. And too often, fathers are very happy to go do something else or spend the morning with the excuse of smoking meat. Um, or I think most guys are just happy to not do anything at all if you give them a choice. And, and so, uh, but happy Father's Day. I'm grateful for the dads here at Redemption Hill who invest their hearts and their lives into their kids, their families, their wives. Um, they're, if people are absent today, they might just be on vacation, so don't draw any conclusions by, by, by what I'm saying right now. Um, and, but also grateful for those of you who are men in the church who also have matured in faith and lead others as spiritual fathers. And so I'm thankful for you. Um, the reason I just gave the caveat that if people are here today, it may be for a variety of reasons, is because here's a hard transition for you. Today's passage is about apostasy. <laughs> so um, it's the way it fell. And, uh, and we, walk through, we typically walk through God's word chapter by chapter in this church and, um, and only recognize Christmas and Easter as, as holidays as far as the texts we study. So we are in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 today, a passage that is one of the most difficult and complicated in the New Testament, certainly one of the hardest warnings in the New Testament. And I think the second hard, or the, one that, the only one that might be harder comes later in Hebrews chapter 10. And so don't worry, we'll get there eventually. And, but as we look at this, this, we've talked about the whole book of Hebrews is most likely a sermon that was preached, um, someone that was not an apostle, but one generation removed from the apostles, but has a lot of echoes of Paul's theology, so likely someone that had worked and ministered alongside the apostle Paul. It was to a church that was in a city, and the church was struggling. The people in the church were struggling. They were worn out. They were tired. They were having a hard time, and this, this sermon came to them as an encouragement to keep going in their faith, to cling to the things that they had heard in the gospel. And so we've seen those encouragements a couple of times along the way already, and now it kind of comes down to bear in a passage that is a hard warning. And it comes to us today, and I think it's, it's important to us because in every generation, this is an issue. It's, it's a challenge, it's a problem that for 2,000 years now, Christians have had a hard time keeping going. It's easy to get worn out and worn down. 
And we're in a a space right now in our nation where we are facing real religious decline. Now, some of that isn't bad because religious decline doesn't necessarily mean a decline of those who actually believe the gospel and follow Christ. Some of it is civil religion. But but there's been a real turn in spiritual life and even in in an attitude towards spiritual institutions like a church. And what's interesting on this, that it'll be, we'll, we'll, it'll be fascinating to see how this bears out, is that millennials in general, which I know some of you are already rolling your eyes in, because millennials are like in their 30s and maybe early 40s, but millennials in general have, have despised institutions, and the early look at Gen Z is that it might be leery, and, but still more ready to commit and trust them. Whatever the case, though, whatever the whims of the age are, true Christianity will never fit neatly into any human culture or system. And at times when Christianity becomes more marginalized, even if not truly marginalized, but just slightly more, that's when its true colors can show. And so this comes to us today as a warning, and I hope we can receive it as such. If you're not a Christian, you're gonna hear today what the good news of the gospel is, what we believe as Christians, and, and the humility that we ought to approach our faith with. So this is what we read. In chapter five, we have just seen that Jesus is the true and greater high priest, the one who comes before God and has made a way for us to draw near to God and with confidence because he is the one who can sympathize with us in our weakness but and has been tempted every way that we are yet without sin, that he laid himself down as our sacrifice. And he says in chapter five, verse 10, that he has been designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the the writer is going to pick that up again in in chapter 6, beginning of chapter 7, but he pauses here. There's a little bit of an excursus, like a parenthesis in this, where you can almost, I can almost feel this guy as he's preaching it, coming to a point of saying like, man, before we get to this Melchizedek stuff, I've got to pause for a minute because I'm losing my listeners. And so this is what he says. About this, Jesus being the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instructions about washings and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will do if God permits For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt For land that has drunk the rain and that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for for whose sake it's cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and the serving of the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
All right, so what we see here is an encouragement to move into maturity, to move beyond just a milk diet and to eat solid food, or some translations here say solid meat. So to move from milk to solid food. And it's saying, what it's saying here is that, that Jesus is a better nourishment for us, that there's a better nourishment that Christ has for us in our lives than some of what we pursue. And so we're going to look at this in this tough passage on apostasy, and there's four observations we're going to make in, along the way. It kind of neatly breaks up into some of the paragraphs that are in front of us. But the first is that there's a call here to mature from milk to solid food. A call to move from milk to solid food, to practice, and do you see what the end is? That the goal in verse 14, solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by a constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And so this is saying that part of maturity in spirituality, in our walk with God, is working daily to distinguish what is good from what is evil, and that will help us to need and to rely on a more nourishing, solid food, and that, that we can eventually then move on beyond a foundation that has been laid. And you see that, that it moves from an eating illustration to a construction illustration and saying, you know, therefore, let's leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of, and it goes on to describe the different aspects. Now, in this context, it's tough to discern whether these, the references then are to Jewish or Christian practices. In Hebrews, people are being tempted and driven toward turning back to old covenant practices and abandoning Christ. To others, this is clearly representative of Christian practices, but whatever the case, it could be either or both. What's important to us is that we can do the same. We can think of the foundational aspects of faith as the only issues to center our focus and attention on and get stuck there. And so you just, did you catch the list that he had? That we need to move beyond the foundation of repentance uh, moving from dead works to faith in God, about instructions and washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And so we need to move beyond the basics of repentance, what it means to turn to Jesus, that we turn away from sin and embrace Christ, putting our trust in him. Now, hear me on this. If you have not had a foundation laid in Christ then you're not ready to move on from the foundation. And this is one of the, the beautiful things and the challenging things in any local church, is that if any local church is doing its work well, then we will always have people who are not Christians, who are exploring faith, well, people who are new to Christianity, and some of you are just learning, and so you're taking in all of these doctrines and the basics of, of the faith, and for you right now, that is the nourishment you need. And we have others of you who've been walking with Jesus for a long time, and Lord willing, are maturing in faith like it describes here. And so I, there's a breadth of, of people in this room that I can even see as I look around right now. And so that's where a passage like this, this gets a little bit sticky, because we, I want to make sure that we don't that those of you who are new to Christianity and new to faith don't leave here going, feeling condemned about like, I don't even know like, what I think about baptism and I'm supposed to move on from it. No, that's okay. If you're not a Christian, I want you to hear that there are basics of Christian faith and a foundation that gets laid before anything else can get built on it. And we have a tendency to approach anything spiritual as, as uh, like most things in our lives and world, that we approach it as an individualized practice so that we're trying to take and borrow from multiple places. And I want you to hear that the representation that we have in, what, in God's word, in the Bible, is that there is no other foundation than Christ. And if you don't start with him as the foundation, then what you have is going to crumble. Jesus says you're building your house on the sand, not on the rock. And so you have the opportunity today that you could turn in belief and repentance and build the found, lay the foundation in Christ for the hope of salvation in your life. But these are the basics, turning to Jesus in repentance, how we are saved, how do we move from, good, good, for de from dead works to faith in God? What is baptism and instructions about how we're baptized and when we're baptized and, and prayer and how we receive prayer and lay hands on each other in prayer about eternity and the resurrection of the dead, what happens to us in the end and about hell and eternal judgment. 
which I think we have a tendency right now to, be, to think like, well, hell is a tough doctrine these days and it's hard to buy into as if it was ever easy. And so these are the essentials, the foundations. And amazingly, these are the things that Christians constantly fight and divide over. They can become the focal point of whole movements. And the author of Hebrews is saying, these are the basics. We divide over, over baptism and approaches to baptism. We divide over our understandings of eternity and, and what is going to happen in the end. We divide over what repentance means and looks like in the pathway to salvation. We certainly divide over the issue of how we're saved. And so for some of you, you are just love the discussion and debate of Arminianism and Calvinism or free will and God's sovereignty. And, and that's, it's an interesting discussion, sure. But if you get stuck there, then you're not going to mature in faith. There's something more than that. And so we need to hear that and hear that corrective because there's a call here to the people in Hebrews, to this church, it's saying, you know, we've got to move on to these things, that that we we need to have this foundation laid, but we can't just keep laying more foundation. Can you imagine a house that was built that way? Think about that. If you laid the foundation slab... And then you decided, you know what we need now? More foundation. And laid another slab. And then decided, you know what we need now? Another foundation. And you ended up with a stack. I mean, what you have in the end, is it a home? No. You would end up, I mean, depending on how many you laid, you would just end up with a concrete cube. That's not helpful or useful to anybody. It's not attractive to the eye. It's ugly. It's unformed. It's unusable. And so we need to hear, I mean, here we're now mixing building metaphors, food metaphors. So let's get back to the food in just a second. (laughs) What are the foundations of the faith? Again, this isn't new. Christianity isn't new at this stage. And so we believe, we can believe and recite something called the Apostles' Creed. I think I have that for us. And so I invite you if, you, if you would like to, to join me in reciting this today. This has been around for millennia. Is the Apostles' Creed is the statement of Christian theology and belief saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the core of Christianity. Before some of you freak out, the word Catholic means universal. It's not the Roman branch. And so, but this is the core of Christianity, the Apostles' Creed. There's nothing new here. And so let's move on from debating those basics into something more. Now, what is it that causes apostasy? What is it that causes somebody to fall away here? Which that's what apostasy is. It's somebody that has rejected Christ and has walked away from the church. And so, and so it's, it's a removal from that covenant community. Well, there's two ways that this is, this is worded in, ch- in chapter 5, verse 11, and in chapter 6, verse 12. We see this, there's a key word here that is only used in these two places in the entire New Testament. So it's not something that we have a lot of, and you have to look into other literature to really get a sense of it. But in the ESV, it says, about this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. And in 6.12, it says, it's, you have this full assurance of hope to the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so the, the connotation of this word, nothros, is, it's, is the same word, and it's, it, the connotation here starts to become clear as you see even those two points of translation. 
There is a laziness, a sluggishness, a hardening, a, an inability to consider God's word and take it in, that we become dull of hearing. And, and you see that in verse 12 of chapter 5, that he says, listen, by this time, some of you ought to be teachers, but you need somebody to teach you again the basic principles of what, what, of what the oracles of God, what God has had to say. And remember, in chapter 1, this book of Hebrews begins by saying, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir over all things. And so God has spoken finally. The final word came through Christ. And so that's the... What can cause apostasy is that we cease to listen to God's word. The theologian Don Carson said here, the, the heart of the issue simply is immaturity in listening to, studying, absorbing, and conforming to the word of God. It is as simple as that. And so this is the warning to us today. Cultivate a passion for God's word. Cultivate in your heart the, the willingness to be able to listen and hear God's word. Conform your life to God's word rather than deciding that you are the authority. Allow God's word to be the authority. Now, this shouldn't be surprising to us. In much of um, scripture, we see that God's word is held up as primary that way. So in Psalm, the first Psalm, we see this. I said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But what is his delight in? The law of the Lord. It's God's word. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That sounds a lot like what we just read in Hebrews chapter 6 that feels that absorb the rain and produce a crop that is useful. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So God's word is held up as primary throughout scripture. In, in fact, in, in Israel, in ancient Israel, this was an incredible commandment that came in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Um, it says in verses 18 and 20 that when a new king is crowned, it says when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all this, the words of his law and these statutes and doing them. That his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Can you imagine this? The first thing that the king was supposed to do was not to get to know the royal cabinet. It wasn't to try to get a lay of the landscape of who the elders and the people were, the Sanhedrin. It wasn't the first thing the king was supposed to do was sit down and write a personal copy of the law. Now, whether that's Deuteronomy or the whole Torah, the first five books, um, we're not quite sure. But can you imagine having to sit down and write out a personal copy so that you can then refer to your handwriting for the rest of your reign as king? And do you see who proofreads it? The Levitical priests. This is like turning it into seminary faculty. And so this is, but it's this practice so that he is immersed in it. Can you imagine if we made and forced people in positions of power to sit down and rewrite by hand the foundational documents that they were sworn to uphold? And so they turn to God's word again and again. And so the call here is to move from milk to solid food. That's something that is, it, it's a beautiful illustration because it doesn't even take much for me as your pastor to try to explain it. We know that a healthy person moves beyond an all-milk diet at some point in their lives. That, that babies need milk. They need the nourishment of breast milk or formula. And, and so that they need to have that nourishment come in. But you, you can't just hand a newborn a steak. 
Now, when our kids were little and before they had teeth, we would sometimes let them like suck on a piece of a peach or a slice of steak. And, and, and they would, but you're not gonna just let it go because what's gonna happen? It's gonna get caught in the baby's trachea and then you've got bigger problems. But we would also say, just wait, you're gonna love having teeth. <laughs> because at some point you wanna move beyond it. Kids naturally move beyond it. If, if you've ever had babies, you get to a point where milk isn't enough, where if you want that baby to sleep through the night, you've got to give it something solid. So you start with like really gross cream of wheat and the soupy and you, you know, baby foods that are mashed up and you move on and move up and up and up and eventually you get to the point where you are eating steak. <laughs> and so there's a call here to say, don't, there's a natural maturation that happens if you turn to Jesus. Don't get stuck in the basics so that you never grow. And then comes the warning against apostasy. In verses four to six, and this is where it gets difficult. These are hard words. He says, we'll move on, if God permits, to maturity. Why? Because for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. He's saying it is impossible for that person who has experienced all these things and then has fallen away. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance. Why? Because they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. This is intense. To say there is no more chance for this person. Somebody who has, in the list here, who has been enlightened, who has tasted the heavenly gift, who has shared in the spirit of God, who has tasted the goodness of God and the powers of the age to come, and then has fallen away, that person has no restoration, no repentance, no sacrifice for sin left for them. Now, I want to be clear. When we get into this passage, what a lot of the discussion turns to, and maybe those of you who are meeting still and haven't broken for the summer in community groups this week will get into debates about, well, can somebody lose their salvation? We're gonna talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, and is this somebody losing their salvation? Is it somebody who was never a Christian and just looked like a Christian? Is this somebody that, you know, a more Lutheran view, like we can't lose our salvation, but we can, you know, Christ holds us in his hand, but I can jump? Um, that, and so that we could get into all those kinds of debates, but here's what we do by doing that. We return to the elementary doctrines. We're arguing over repentance and the order of salvation. And we're not taking seriously the warning that's been given to us. And so if we just get caught up in those debates, we won't actually receive God's word here. And we won't grow and mature. And so I want to help us to move past some of those debates. Those are interesting. They're important. But there's something more important here for us. And so I don't think that this is about a teenager who struggles with their faith after leaving home and struggles with making it their own. That we can say, well, they grew up in the church, therefore there's no salvation left for them. I don't think so. I don't think this is about somebody who's backsliding. I also don't think backsliding is a particularly biblical concept. Struggling with sin is not an abandonment of Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we get an even scarier word because in Hebrews 10, which I've already previewed is the harsher warning, we actually hear there, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And so I think that can address some of that, but I don't think it's just addressing somebody who's backsliding or struggling or whose faith has felt cold. I don't think this is somebody who sins terribly but then turns again in repentance. I don't think it's someone who has been hurt by someone in a church and has a hard time with church, but still clings to Jesus. That's, I don't think this is properly applied in those places. Don Carson, again here, says, this is the case of someone who has been brought close enough to taste something of the transforming grace of God, seeing what the gospel truly is, understanding it, believing it, being in some measure cleaned up by it, and then, because there is no grace of perseverance, because that's not a component of their faith, they look it straight in the eyeball, see it for what it is, and still say, eh, it's hellish and demonic. I will walk away from it. That's the person being described here. Somebody who has experienced 
experienced something of salvation and still decides this is false and walks away. We need to hear this because a religious experience is not the same as saving faith. And for some of us, we chase religious experiences. That this is the classic thing of like, of I love camps, uh, it, but you go to a Christian camp and you can have like that mountaintop experience, or a Christian conference and that mountaintop experience, or sometimes you have a particular time in worship that you may look back to and say, "Gosh, that was a moment or a period in your life where you have those experiences," and you start to associate the the goodness of God with the warm fuzzies that you feel in a particular moment. Our hearts are so fickle, though. And so we know that religious experience isn't, that we know that we can take all kinds of things in without fully ingesting them. Some of us know that better than others. Some of us just ingest everything. But think about this, like a sommelier knows everything about a wine. I mean, the, stuff, the test that a sommelier and the training to go through is insane. To be able to name, say, cite regions and particular vineyards because they're able to do it by the smell of the wine or the taste of the wine and the different methods they have for discerning those things. But a good sommelier is not drinking wine all day, right? When you go to a wine tasting, they tell me you're supposed to spit it out. Because that, otherwise you get too drunk, it'll dull your senses. And so you, you can taste it get the benefit of it, but not actually ingest the wine. I was uh, thinking about this as we studied as a staff team. Um, Tatum, our children's director, talked about in college, uh, she was uh, in a, she did a bunch of study on cults, which is very interesting. And one of her teachers handed out chocolate truffles, one of the class periods, or one of the classes, and had each person, that she, and she directed them on how slowly to eat the chocolate truffle and to put it in their mouths and, and to experience it as slowly as they could. And to a person, every person in that class said that was the best chocolate truffle they've ever had in their lives. Now, was it actually quality-wise the best they'd ever had? Who knows? But it's because of the way that they slowed down to experience it. Now, um, there's different, I mean, chefs have discovered this. Massimo Batura, who, um, you know, he has a, one, of the, one of the top restaurants in the world, used to s sell pasta in bowls, and he realized, if I sell a bowl of tortellini, nobody's gonna come here, but if I serve six tortellini, playfully plated, then everybody thinks it's a mastery because they t slow down to actually taste the tortellini. We experience this in concerts, that we can go and have an experience and taste something. We experience it at church. But there's a danger here. The warning here is, if you've been there and you've actually had your life impacted somehow by the good news of the gospel and you still look at it and reject it and walk away, you're on dangerous ground. This is the danger right now of deconstruction. And that's tough because that word has come to mean everything and nothing. But deconstruction could be if, it's, if deconstruction is, is deconstructing extra-biblical Christianity and disentangling true Christianity and the gospel from cultural and institutional expressions, then that's good. We should do that. We should always be reforming and looking at Scripture and trying to refine our lives and our church practices by it. But if deconstruction is tearing down God's word, the gospel, Christ's supremacy and sufficiency, diminishing the work of the Holy Spirit, if deconstruction is taking down the, the basics that we saw of repentance, moving from dead works to faith in God, instructions about washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, then deconstruction is not just taking down things that have been built on the Christian foundation, but they are, they are diminishing the work of the Holy Spirit and diminishing the gospel itself, and that is dangerous. Again, disentanglement of cultural Christianity, fine, good. But I think the possibility of some of the most prominent voices is that there's been a laziness in handling God's word. It can be a capitulation to cultural winds or, in, or individual desires of saying, this is antiquated, I don't think we should believe this anymore. We've grown past this, we're better than this. I know better than God, or the classic, I can't worship a God and won't worship a God who. 
If that's the deconstruction, then God, a God who we shape ceases to be a God worthy of worship because it, God then is just an idolized version of ourselves. There are times when God meets us distinctively. And whether it's service, a sermon, a conference, there will be times that are key markers in our faith, in our walk with God, but there's a dangerous in clinging too tightly to them. Um, in, first, in First Kings 19, we see this with Elijah in the cave. For some of you, this would be a familiar story. For some of you, it won't. But the, Elijah had just defeated the prophets of Baal. He had stood up to King Ahab, he was, he was a guy that was coming down from the ultimate mountaintop of seeing God work in powerful ways where the, all the prophets of Baal, they couldn't get their God to respond to burn their sacrifices. And Elijah called on the, the Lord God of, of Israel, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the sacrifice was burned and he defeated them on this mountain. And then he immediately heard that Jezebel, the queen, was coming after him. And so he took off into the desert and found a cave a cave, not a cage, <laughs> and, uh, and stayed in that cave. And he stayed there and he was terrified. And he, and he said, like, Lord, take away my life. I'm no better than my father's. And he, he was depressed. He fell asleep under a broom tree. And then he woke up and an angel said, arise and eat. And he looked before him, his head was a cake baked on stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat. This journey is too great for you. He rose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food and for 40 days. So basically God said, Elijah, you're depressed. You're, you're, you're actually like getting into some suicidal ideation here. Take a nap and eat some bread. But then the Lord came to speak to Elijah. He called him out of the cave and said, stand there before the Lord. And it says to us, and he said, God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. And the, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Too often, we're looking for something massive and dramatic to assure us of our faith and our salvation. We're looking for the whirlwind. We're looking for the earthquake. We're looking for the fire. But we don't realize that God comes to us in that still, small whisper, like he did Elijah in the cave. All right, so... We need to mature from milk to solid food. We, there's a warning here against walking away, against apostasy. And then third, we need to look at the fruit of our lives. And this gets into chapter 6, verses 7 to 8. It says um, here, that, why, why is it that there's no hope for us? Well, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those who, for whose sake it's cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. This is not unfamiliar in Scripture either. Jesus says this. Um, in his teaching in many places. But in Luke 6, it says, For no tree, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, of the heart, his mouth speaks." And so Jesus encouraged us, us the same thing. If you want to know what somebody believes, if you want to know what is happening in someone's heart, look at the fruit of their lives. This is the great value of community because you, can't, you can put a face on for people that you don't know and you can sustain that face for a little bit of time, but not forever. When you're with somebody in community, it will be exposed over time. And when we're in each other's lives consistently, it's harder to hide. But, but this is what the author of Hebrews is encouraging, saying, look at the fruit of your own life. Do some self-assessment here. 
And it's a funny picture that he gives, that Jesus gives in, in Luke 6. Like that we, we, I think we lose some of the humor of Jesus' teaching at times because we, we just look at everything so somberly. But he's saying, listen, you can't just put figs on a thorn bush. You can't put grapes on a bramble. Like you can, you could lay, you could lay fruit, you could lay grapes on a bramble, and, but they would dry up because there's no nourishment there. There's nothing to keep them going. It can't be sustained. And some, for some of you, that's the warning here. Look at your own life and, and ask the question, are you hanging up fake fruit on your life to try to look a certain way or does your life reflect what's happening truly in your heart? Look at the way you speak because it's out of the overflow of our, heart, our hearts that our mouths speak. If it's fake, it'll dry up over time, and that's the warning in Hebrews here. Now, what is the fruit of God's work in you? This, again, is clear in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, I want you to notice one thing before we turn that slide. Notice that it is not fruits of the Spirit, it's singular. It's really easy for us to read a verse like this and say, okay, I'm pretty kind. I think joy and peace and love, ah, patience, but I've got, I've got other fruits. Now this is the fruit of God's Spirit within us what your life will look like if you're walking with Jesus, what your life will look like as the Spirit is molding each one of us into the image and likeness of Christ is this way, that you will have an increase of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so look to the fruit of your life, and then finally, the fourth, earnest perseverance leads to hope. So this is where it ends, and you love this, because I can like feel this preacher's pastoral heart coming out for his church. It, you can, he says this hard thing about, about there's no opportunity left for those that turn away after these experiences, and then he, in, ver, in, in verse nine, goes on to say, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Why? For God is not so unjust, unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so again, here you can hear it. The author of Hebrews wants us to hear and receive this real warning. He wants us to feel the weight of that and the tension of that. And, 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 but he also wants us to be reassured that if you're, if you're following Jesus, look at the fruit of your life. God's not just going to overlook the things that you do. He's not going to overlook the love that you have for his name that, that flows out in the way that you are serving the saints, serving other people around you. Like there's the, he's talking about the, like the cruciform realities of the gospel and a transformed life, that you will love God with everything you are, and you're loving others self-sacrificially as yourself, and that, that is a fruit of God's work within you. And so this is the tension we do have in the New Testament. There is no way, I would argue, to read the New Testament in its wholeness. We can read individual verses, but if you read the New Testament in its wholeness, there is no way to make the argument that we can lose salvation if Christ has saved us. We've been adopted before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1. In John 6, no one can take us out of, Christ's hand, out of Jesus' hand. In Jude 25, God himself will prevent us from stumbling and carry us to the end. And so it's impossible to come away with the thought that we are at risk of losing our salvation. But also, we need to be careful not to fall into an assumption of salvation that hasn't been shown in perseverance. It says here, to, there is this warning, but then there's also this call. Don't be dull and lazy and sluggish when it comes to God's word. If you want to avoid apostasy, take God's word seriously. Walk in faith in your life. 
I heard um, one of my mentors, spiritual fathers, one time say in a sermon, it, it, when we look around at other people in our lives and think, wow, that person has a lot of faith. Look at the things that they've done. Look at, at the steps they've taken. And we can look at people and you just like admire the faith that they've shown along the way. You wonder, like, I could never do something like that. What his encouragement was, I'll give to you today. What you ought to do is think about the things right now that you might do if you had more faith or the faith to do them. Then go do them. Your faith will follow. Faith is putting ourselves in a position of dependency and trusting God to move and work. So don't be dull and lazy and sluggish with God's word. Take it seriously and then look to those who have finished the race well. Imitate them. This is the value right now of dead saints. Like I, I, as the more scandal you watch, the more people that are, the more sin that's brought to light, the more heroes and giants of faith that seem to be falling all around us right now, the more I'm grateful for those who have made it to the end and made it into Jesus' presence without scandal, without apostasy. And so we can look to those who have come before us and persevere, keep going with faith and patience to the end. Each one of us bears responsibility for our own lives and actions and faith. It's in community, but, you, but nobody else is responsible for you fully. You are responsible for the way that you walk with God, for whether or not you're allowing your, yourself to be used as his instrument, for the fruit of your own life as the spirit moves through you. And so you're responsible for your lives and actions and faith. And so this is the warning today, that if you're, a, if you're not a Christian, then come, lay the foundation with Christ so that you can build your, your life and your hope on something that will last. You need, biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Biblical hope is a settled confidence in God's word and his promises that they are true and that they will stand to the end. And so biblical hope is not, you know, uh, Alyssa and Zoe are driving to South Carolina on Wednesday, and I hope they get there. I, I do hope, but I don't have any, <laughs> there's, I, I don't have the word that says they're going to get there without a flat tire or without some kind of, or get stuck at south of the border for a while. Biblical hope is saying what God has told us is true. What he's given us is true. What he's promised is true and building our lives on that foundation. So if you're not a Christian, you can begin to build that foundation of belief and trust in Christ today. If you are a Christian, then this is the call to you. At some point, you've got to mature beyond milk to solid food. Keep nourishing your heart on Christ and on God's word. Don't be careful and hear the warning against walking away and the danger of apostasy. Look at the fruit of your own life and see if you're in danger or if your life reflects faith in Christ and, and then realize that your earnest perseverance is what will lead you to hope. Keep going. Let's look ahead to those who have gone before as inspiration to persevere and trust Christ the whole way. And I do want to say this because it is Father's Day. Dads, you are given a particular responsibility before God, a weight that you carry for your family. If you're a dad, you will answer to God for how your family is doing spiritually. You'll answer for whether you have, in, in the description in Ephesians 5 that we hear for husbands is, it, with their wives is, is the washing of the water of God's word over her. And so again, what is it that you are, have responsibility? You can't control people. You can't control decisions. People are free acting human beings. Those of you who have kids realize that very young and it only gets more so. But you have responsibility to constantly be bringing the washing of, their washing of water with God's word pouring over them in their lives. And so that is the, you're not responsible in that way, not just for yourself, but making sure that there's opportunity to hear and receive God's word and to keep hearts and ears from becoming dull. And so, press on. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now for those who are not Christians, that your word would sink in, that that for those who are on the fence today of 
they've been exploring Jesus and exploring Christianity, but they're not sure, I pray that you would give uh, the movement of your spirit to bring your gentle touch and assurance of your presence and, sal- and their salvation and uh, the courage to be able to take a step to entrust themselves to you. Father, I pray for those who are here. There are undoubtedly some of us who are playing Christianity and not actually walking with Christ, who are in danger of what this passage is saying, are in, because hearts have become dull, ears are closed, because there isn't a consistent pursuit of you through your word. I pray that you would bring conviction and real salvation and give them the courage to take that step and to admit that it's been a game. Father, I pray for those who are new to following you and are are in the stage of milk and trying to take in the basic understanding and foundation of Christian faith, that you would help them to be encouraged today and their hearts lifted, that the more that they grow and mature, the more that, that these things become not just milk but solid food and it gets sweeter and more complex and more beautiful over time. And Father, for all of us, I pray that you would give us a taste for your word, a hunger and thirst for it. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.